Father, we just ask you in thy name, Lord, to put the name of Jesus on this ceiling, for the blood of Jesus to be around this place. We ask you for your grace, Lord, to have a wonderful service tonight, that the root of God's word will go down into our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. God, we ask you to kiss this word. We learned about the kisses last night. We ask you to kiss this word tonight into our hearts and into our spirit. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I want you to turn with me to Joshua. Fasten your seatbelts and let's go. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn to Joshua chapter 3. 3. Thank you, Father. Good to have my grandbabies here tonight. Love those baby kisses. Joshua, raise, raise your hand. That's Joshua. Ariana, raise your hand. That's Ariana. Aren't they beautiful? Amen. Amen. I tried to get them to have me another one, but I can't seem to talk them into it. I'll keep trying, though. Amen. I'm not, I've got another granddaughter that's 18, I think. And her name is Julia. She lives in Tennessee. So, hallelujah. I've got three gorgeous ones, and I'm happy. Amen. This is, uh, let's start with, we're going to skip around. So, chapter 3. Has everybody got it? Yes. We're going to skip around in this chapter. Let's go to verse 2, 3, and 4, and then 6. And it came to pass, after three days, the, the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites, bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go, for ye have not passed this way heretofore. We're going to read some more in a second, but I'm going to set the stage here. Israel had come all the way across the wilderness. They got to the edge of the water, and... Uh, Joshua was saying, okay, here's how this is going to go. We're going to go through this river, and just like the Red Sea, it's going to pile up. And you're going to stand, the priests are going to stand in the middle of it as the, and make a way. They're going to stand there with the Ark of the Covenant, with the holiness of God, and the people of God are going to cross over. Now let's see what happens, because this is really exciting. Let's go down to verse 6. And Joshua, we're talking about you, Joshua. <laughs> and Joshua spake unto the priests, saying, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass over before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Now let's go down to verse 13. And it shall come to pass as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests yeah. that bear the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above. What is that? Rain. And they shall stand up on a heap. So any rain water coming down is going to stand on a heap as well as the water that they have gone through. Let's go to verse 15. And as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overfloweth all his banks all the time of the harvest, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam that is beside Zeratan, and those that came down toward the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed." and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho, and the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. Let's go down to chapter 4, verse 3. And command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. How many? Twelve. And ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Go down to verse 8. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the middle of the Jordan 
as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them until the place where they lodged and laid them down there. Verse 9, and Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the Ark of the Covenant stood and they are there unto this day. Verse 10, for the priest which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Now let's go back to chapter 3 again. I want to go over some things here. He said when you see the ark of the covenant and the priest bearing it, then you remove and you go back. 2,000 cubits by measure. I want you to notice there were three days there that they had to wait before yes. that. They had to wait three days. Yes. Keep that in mind. And then they went over into the Jordan and what happened next? He said very clearly that when you see the Ark of the Covenant and the priest, then you remove and 2,000 cubits by measure. Do you know that in 2,000 years Jesus came? And did you know within three days he rose again? And did you know that, that they went into the middle of the Jordan and they stood there as an intercessor in the dry river bed and then the children of Israel were able to go over? How long did Jesus stay in hell? Three days. Till what? Till the blood of Jesus was going to help us pass over Jordan on to the other side. I want you to know that all through the Bible, God has his name, Jesus, written from page to page to page. His name is in there. And Jesus said, by type and by shadow, those stones, take 12 of them out so everybody can see them. And take 12 right in the middle of the Jordan where the feet of the priest stood and put them there. Why? Because the name of Jesus was going down into the Jordan. I said the name of Jesus was going down into the Jordan. Now hang on. Amen. Amen. So here they go. Glory to God. They don't know what they're doing by type and shadow. That's why I tell you when you're praying, you don't always knew, know what you're doing by type and shadow. You may be swinging your arms. You may be uh, playing the viola. Hallelujah. You might be doing all kinds of things when you're in intercession and travail. And you don't understand it. But I want you to know that the Holy Spirit has a plan, a type, and a shadow for everything that's done. Amen. And so Israel had to wait till the way was made before they could cross over. Now, many times we know Jordan represents what? Death. Many times they, go, they talk about going over the river Jordan. I want you to know it's precious that he went there before us. Hallelujah. That we don't have to go there alone. But he went before us. And he as the great high priest, as the priests are bearing the ark over Jordan, the great high priest went before us. So that when it comes our day, when it comes our hour, there's already been put the name of Jesus down in Jordan. So that when you cross over, you're not going by yourself. And all where his name is, where his authority is, where his power is, where his glory is. Hallelujah. You're going to know exactly what you're doing. Now let's fast forward. One day John the Baptist was standing in the Jordan. Sure knew where I was going. Hallelujah. And what happened? He was standing there baptizing people. And suddenly, you know, it was just like any ordinary day for John. He was out there every day baptizing, knocking them under and pulling them back up. Amen. Washing their sins away, getting them to repent for the kingdom of God was at hand. But one day it changed. John stood there and he was waiting on something. You see, what we're doing is we're waiting on something. We're waiting on God to go before us. We're waiting on the Jordan River to part for us. We're waiting for God to say, come on, let's get those stones and let's put our feet where his name is and let's take it up. So John was standing there on the banks of the Jordan just like any other time. I tell you, church, one day we're going to be doing what we have to do every day. We're going to be doing the dishes.
foolishness or we're going to be sitting in church or we're going to be doing something when all of a sudden we're going to look up and we're going to see the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world and our day is going to change. It'll be a different day. It'll be a different time. It'll be a different hour. It won't be like any other day. It won't be like any other time and nobody else will see him but we'll have to say look, look stood there and he went in there and he said John baptize me well you know what baptize, baptizing it represents death yes. what does Jordan represent yeah. death and John says I can't baptize you I'm not worthy to baptize you I can't baptize you see John knew it meant death he knew it meant death. Would you want to baptize Jesus? I wouldn't either. I wouldn't want to say, all right, you're going down in death. But he looked at him and he said, let me tell you something. It behooves us to fulfill all righteousness, John. I've got to go before my people. Just like the Ark of the Covenant went through the Jordan. It had to go first. He said, I've got to go through death first. I've got to stand in the Jordan first. I've got to make a way first. I've got to die so that somebody can live. I've got to resurrect so somebody don't have to live in death the rest of the time. And so there he went. But you know what else he did in the Jordan? He picked up the name. Because when Israel went over and they carried the ark across and they had the 12 stones in the water, it was laying a foundation for the name. See, the new Jerusalem has 12. Come on. How many things are 12? And Jesus was laying out the name. But you know what? When he went in the Jordan, he said, John, baptize me. He went down in death. He picked back up the name and he brought it out of death as a symbol, as an illustration that I'm going down, but don't you worry because I'm coming back up. Oh, somebody praise him tonight. Glory to God. No wonder John didn't want to put him down. But Jesus showed that he had dominion over death. He was prophesying with that act. He was prophesying, and when they put him in that water, he was prophesying, I'm going down, but I'm coming back up. You may be down today, but you're coming back up. You may be going through the wheel, what we were talking about last night. You might be going back down on the side of the darkness of the wheel, but you're coming back up. Because he said, because he's made a way, we can have the way made, and we can walk right through it. Praise God. It's wonderful to know that Jesus loves us and demonstrates his favor on, our, on a laid down life. Yes. Hallelujah. He demonstrates his favor on a laid down, totally surrendered life. God demonstrates it. And the Holy Spirit came down and the voice said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He knew that what Jesus started, Jesus would finish. And let me tell you something. Jesus started it before he ever got here. Right. Amen. The Bible said, hallelujah, said that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was already slain. So when he stood there in type and shadow and went down under the rivers of the Jordan and was brought back up, hallelujah, the dove of the Holy Spirit, and I have seen that dove. I have had it light on my shoulder in a vision. And it was, it was just the most wonderful experience I've ever had. I could just feel the, the, the dove's uh, breast against the shoulder, against my cheek. And he spoke to me and he said, I love you. I love you. I love you. Nobody can say those words like the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came down and the voice of God spoke, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The Lord said again, Hear ye him and another thing. Hallelujah. I'm ready to hear the words of Jesus. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him in truth. And I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. See, the name of the Lord, hallelujah, is a high tower that the righteous run into and are saved. And when Jesus raised up that name Jesus, that is the family name. 
People ask me about baptism all the time. Well, I'm going to tell you what I believe about baptism. I believe that I'm going to marry Jesus one day. I believe he's my bridegroom. And I am a spouse to him. And one day he's going to be my glorious heavenly bridegroom. And if I'm going to go down in the waters of death, I want to take on his name. So you can say, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, that's fine. Just make sure you say in the name of Jesus. Because that's the name that I'm taking on for eternity. Amen? Amen. That's the family name. The name is Jesus. That's the name. And there's all these religions that are started from other names. Saying his name is Yahweh or his name is... Uh, I'm not saying, you know, it's not God. I'm just saying, but the name is Jesus. That's the name that's been given to us. Amen? It's not just Elohim and Jehovah and all that. But the name that God gave, there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. But the name of Jesus. That is the name. That's the family name. That is the name of the Father. That is the name of the Son. That is the name of the Holy Ghost. I did a study with a Greek and a Hebrew scholar one time. And I asked him, I said, you tell me about that because... Uh, he was studying it. He said, you know what? He came back and studied it in the Greek and in the Hebrew. And he said, these are offices. They are not names. The name of the Father, he's a Father. The name of the Son, he's a Son. The name of the Holy Ghost, he's a Holy Ghost. Those are offices of the Godhead. Those are offices. There's only one name given to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. Hallelujah. And he's given us that name. And that's why he took it up in the Jordan. And he lifted up the name. And he said, Hallelujah. Yes, yes. Amen. Thank yes. you, Lord. Yes. Now, we want to talk about the power that that name gives us. We want to go back to the cross. And I want to talk about that. Because something happened on the cross that sometimes we don't take note of. But it has to do with lifting up the name. See, because we've got to learn to lift up that name in every situation. You've got to lift up that name. Jesus was on the cross. What was going on? There were dynamics right then that people did not see. Remember we talked about the fiery love this week? About the crown of thorns and about the, about the fire, the thorny bush. How God decided to display his fiery love in a thorn bush. And how just, just in case you weren't here, how when God's love and deliverance was ready to come on the scene and deliver Israel, that fire fell on that thorny bush and it caught on fire and Moses turned aside to go see it. And he said, I've got to see this thing. What's going on? That was God's fiery delivering love lighting on the thorn bush. And he said, Moses, down in that fire in that thorn bush now let's go back to the cross again because standing on the cross was Jesus with what around his head thorns but if you could see brothers and sisters what was on that thorn on those thorns there was a fiery love of deliverance in the heart of God and Jesus to deliver his people from Satan from hell from death hallelujah there was a fire love on the head of Jesus. By type and shadow, it happened back in a desert place. Let me tell you, it'll be in a desert place many times where God sends his delivering fire. Glory to God. And there he was, Jesus, on the cross with the thorns on his head. But what you could not see was that same fire, that same fire that followed Israel through the wilderness, that same fire, hallelujah, that stood between Pharaoh and Israel, that He stood there on the cross and he had a burning passion and fiery love to deliver people from sin. But what was happening below the cross? There were all kinds of voices. You're the son of God. Why don't you just come down? Physician, heal yourself. You healed other people. Why can't you just come off the cross? And they were being as vile as they could be. 
and as indignant as they could be. And below Jesus, below the bottom of that cross, there's all that profanity and vileness. And I told you last night under that cross, uh, those soldiers wanted that garment that he was wearing. They wanted to gamble and buy that. They want the glory, but they don't want the cross. They want the glory, but they don't want the cross. I said they wanted the glory, but they didn't want the cross. So Jesus stood there and all this is going down below him. Let me tell you something. During your crucifixion hour, when someone you love has died or when somebody uh, that's close to you has turned their back on you or something has happened and you're standing there on that crucifixion and you're saying, Lord, I belong to you. I don't know how you're going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. God, I don't know what's coming next. I don't know what pain I'm going to suffer next. But Jesus said, what they're saying down there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work in love. Yes. Because see, below you, when you're going through a trial, is hate. Yes. People are, it, you know, notice that when, when you're down or somebody's down, how everybody just jumps on you? Yeah. And that's what was happening to Jesus. Everybody was, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, hating him. Mm-hmm. And he could have, at that hour, begin to just curse them or say, or he could have rocked off the cross. But he decided to finish the course and he decided to walk with that fiery love, the thorns on his head. And I want you to know when they beat him, they beat him with the crown on. They beat him with the crown on so that it dug into his head and the blood began to flow. Oh, but thank God that that precious blood never loses its power. It's not lost somebody who praise him because he went back. Like I told you yesterday, he said, Touch me because I've got to put the blood on the altar in heaven. I've got to take the blood. We're talking about fire on the altar. And I'm taking the blood and I'm putting it on the altar in heaven. And then he comes back and appears to the disciples. And he says to Thomas, touch me. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. He still had the filth and the degradation of hell on him. Because he stood there and he took on our sins. Why they were hating him and why he was forgiving them. They were hating him while he was forgiving them. And he chose love above instead of hate below. And you and I have a choice each and every day that we live. There's going to be somebody in your face, somebody trying to destroy you, somebody trying to put down your name and your reputation. There's constantly going to be warfare, and you have a choice and a decision to make. Either you're going to say, this person needs deliverance, and begin to travail with that fiery love on your head, and say, God, please bring them to the cross. Or you're going to give in, and you're going to come down off the cross, because see, for Jesus to get down there to that degradating place, he would have had to come off the cross and not finish his job. He had to stay on the cross with that fiery love and finish the job that he started. But you and I, we get off of that cross. We don't want to be tied to that thing. We don't want to go down into the waters of his name, death, and and all those things. We don't want to be purified and cleansed. We want everything quick and easy, comfortable and convenient. I want you to know this life and this walk is not comfortable and it's not convenient. It's a hard way. But you've got to make up your mind you're going to stay up there with Jesus and have a fiery love because he's going to take up his name. He, they laid it down in Jordan. He picked it up in Jordan. He went through Jordan through death and he picked it back up Amen. Praise the Lord. 
Every time we go through these places, it is an opportunity for us to praise the name of the Lord and lift it up. Amen. It is our opportunity when you get a flat tire to not cuss and come down to that level, but begin to worship the Lord. Amen. It's your opportunity when somebody's getting snippy with you to be nice. And to let them see the love in you instead of seeing Amen. that lowercase hate. Yeah. All right. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to mess with your stuff yeah. again tonight. Yeah. Amen. I've been doing it all week. Yeah. We make a decision then to lift up the name. Let me tell you something. When you're, you, you don't think anything of it. But in the, if you can see in the spirit realm, the dynamics are tremendous. When you choose love over hate... God releases all kinds of glory on your life. If you could just see that. And you know, um, I, I get a chance almost every day to put this into practice. Almost every day an opportunity presents itself to me. And I have a choice to either go down and be, be like that or to survive and thrive in love and lift up the name. Now, we who know Jesus Christ should know him well enough and have experienced his favor well enough to just automatically lift up the name. Come on. Amen? Amen? Someone butts in front of you, either in your car or in a line. I remember one day I was on a three, four day fast, and I had to get something from one of my kids, and I was going through a convenience store. And I just thinking, oh God, I was so weak. I said, just get me through this line. And someone just pushed me right out of the way and got in front of me. I tell you, for a couple seconds there, I got a little serious. And then the Lord said, why are you fasting? I said, okay, okay, Lord, okay. And I had to come back and get another opportunity to lift up the name. And when those things happen, you look at it as an opportunity. And you say in your heart, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to praise your name. And boy, the rewards are so great. When you get to heaven, the Bible said that your mansion is thoroughly furnished with good works. So when you do these things and you lift up the name, you are putting good works, amen, ahead of you. Now, next to Jesus, there was something else going on. What was going on? You had this man on the cross. And you had this man on the cross. And this man on the cross was making fun of Jesus because that's what was in him. What is in you is going to come out at the time of trial. If you're angry with God and you don't love God and you don't understand that you're writing that will we talked about last night and that your seasons are going to go under that will as well as come up to the, to the daytime. If you don't ride that will with patience and love and know what you're doing, I want you to know you're going to miss your opportunity and you may miss heaven. Amen. It's time we learn to take up the name of Jesus and everything. And so here this man, the reason he was talking about Jesus and making fun of Jesus is because that's what was in him. He had never lifted up the name and nature of Jesus Christ. Right. See, name means nature. Yes. Name means character and nature. Oh. We're not here just to use the name. That's that. If we just use the name in that format, it can be witchcraft. You've got to use the name in spirit and in truth. Yes. Listen to what I'm telling you. There's a lot of people on earth named Jesus. Mm -hmm. And if you're not saying it in spirit and in truth, it's just another name and you're just using it like someone would use it for, for some kind of uh, charm. Yes. Amen. You might. <laughs> so you've got to use it in spirit and truth. So this man had never lifted up the name of the Father. He had never taken on the character of God. He never wanted to even come close to that. And on the other side, this man does a phenomenal thing. He begins to lift up the name. He didn't know Jesus, but he knew Jesus. Hallelujah. He learned something standing on that cross on the other side of Jesus. He learned what the true nature of love was. He noticed that Jesus was not cussing and fussing, but was saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He was interceding for them. And this man said, I don't understand how he can do this, but there's something there I don't have a hold of. And this man over here starts talking about him. And this man says, 
what's the matter with you? He said, we deserve what we're getting. We have never lifted up the name. We have never done right. We have never taken on the character of God. We deserve what we're getting. We're getting what we deserve. You need to back off. Don't you even fear God? Don't you even fear God? And then, coming to the end of his life, he turns to Jesus and he says, Will you remember me? This was his last bit of hope. He had lived a rotten, terrible life. He had either been a thief or a murderer. But at that moment, something was quickened in him. When he stood next to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, there was something about the name and the nature of the man that he was standing next to that changed his life. And he stood there and he said, Will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I recognize there's something in your nature that I never had. I understand there's something in you I've never possessed. Will you remember me? And here this ungodly man was lifting up the name that daily we cast down. We do. Every time you give in to temptation, you cast the name down. Every time you resist, you lift it up. You become one with his name and with his nature. And Jesus stood there and he was amazed. He looked at that man and he says, I tell you today, today. you'll be with me mm -hmm. in paradise. Thank you. Today you've taken on my nature. You've taken on my name and you've changed your life. I tell you, church, this is what stands before you a choice yes. and an opportunity. If Jesus prophetically, they put down his name in the Jordan, he took it up in the Jordan, he went to hell for you and I, yes. and he took it up and he's saying to Mary, don't touch me yet till I put the blood on the altar and he comes back and he says, now you can touch me. Yes. Now you can touch me. He's not a God that cannot be touched with a feeling of your infirmity. Yes. But we need to learn to lift him up. And if we start lifting him up, God is going to come in and step into the Jordan with you. And he said he would not allow the priest to go to the other side till everyone had passed over. Amen. And I want you to know tonight that there are names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And God knows who you are. And there's names that are being blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. See, I believe that all the names were there to begin with, but people, as they make final decisions to step out of the kingdom, their name is blotted out. So their name was there, but then it's not anymore. And he'll say, sorry, I never knew you. And each and every day, you have a chance and a choice to make. And you can lift up that name and take on his nature. See, it's about having his nature. It's about not just being a Christian by name, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind and taking on his nature. Amen. So I'm going to end with that tonight because Sunday morning I may take up, and I'm not sure, you be in prayer, uh, demonic gangs. I may take up the subject of demonic gangs because I want you to see what happens when you don't take on the nature of Christ and how these spirits run in gangs. And when one opens the door, they all come in. So we may study on that. But you've got a new understanding tonight of the name. Amen? You've got a new understanding of taking of the name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. So we're just so happy tonight. Um, I'm... I'm about finished with all this, but I'm, what I'm going to do, since we've gone through it so quickly tonight, is open the floor for any questions that you may have over any of the lessons this week so far, or any comments you have on the lessons that we've had this week. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Well, all right. Let's say a prayer over the word, and let's ask God. To yes. change our Same. nature. Same. Father, we come to you in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus. And in the midst, God, of the discipline 
in the midst, Lord, of you demonstrating man's um, shortness and how they're profane against the name of Jesus. Father, we ask you to take our nature, turn it around, change us. And, Lord, we want to look at you in the day of trial and say, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. And, Father, we ask, Lord, that this lesson come to our mind every time we're tempted and tried. Every time something comes, let us lift up the name of Jesus. Let us lift it up, God, and become one with the man on the cross next to us. Let us go back, God, and realize, Jesus, that you demonstrated in the Jordan, God, that your name is to be placed inside of us. And I ask you to place that name, place that nature in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to turn the service back over. and.